Good morning. So what I would like to convince you today that we are really um, uh, surrounded uh, by multiple uh, uh, essays and markers that are uh, being introduced us to identify a uh, high-risk patient. And when we are um, being test a, a marker or a new essay, we need to ask ourselves several questions. Um, what is this marker? Is this just a marker of disease, of situation, general marker? It's more specific or it actually participate in the disease process. So let me just start give you some two simple cases. So patient A uh, is a 71-year-old male, came with a TIA, uh, he, has some con he has some risk factors, total cholesterol 170, blood pressure slightly elevated, but not too bad, he does no medication, he has a framing score of 17. We all see this patient in our clinic. But he has a, because of his risk factor, we treat him as a coronary disease equivalent. And here's the second patient, very similar in age, present with a different uh, kind of lesion, but uh, uh, very similar. Risk factors, highly, uh, slightly elevated cholesterol, blood pressure is better under control because he's taking hydrotyrosine, more or less the same frame ring score and the same. But we see this patient and we know that these patients are not equal, they are, they are different. And the question is that who is the most vulnerable patient? Who is this patient is going to come to us with a vent? Who are the patients that we need to uh, treat more aggressively? And that's where we come and use risk markers or risk uh, to uh, guide us to how to treat this patient. So this is what we have now from risk markers. We have a, a, a forest of essays and risk markers and risk factors. We need to choose what's the right one uh, for this particular patient. So this time I will focus about on LPPLA2 uh, and you know that LDL is oxidized in the vascular wall, and oxidized is considered of release by LPPLA2. And we have the, uh, the oxidized LDL um, and the LPPLA2 split the uh, oxidized LDL to lysopc and oxidized fatty acid. It's important to know that LPPLA2 is actually working on the oxidized LDL, which already are therogenic. So it's not on the LDL itself, but already on oxidized LDL. As a result of that, Ox uh, Lyso PC is a very heterogenic uh, factor. Um, it's uh, involved in macrophage recruitment, foam cell, plaque formation, decrease of nitric oxide, and monocyte adhesion. So it's a very heterogenic molecule. Now, when we go and check the LPPLA2 uh, 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 enzyme activity, we have several ways to do that. We can look at the mass of the enzyme, the activity of the enzyme, and if we cannot measure the activity, we can these two products, lysopc and oxidized fatty acid, to see what happened to the byproduct that actually created the heterogenic. So this is the cycle of all the patients that we see with heart disease, from early disease, risk factors, endothelial dysfunction, early stage, myocardial ischemia, infarction, stroke, heart failure, and death. And in each one, when we examine a marker, we need to be sure that the marker is more or less specific and give us information in any one of these stages. Every stage we, s we stop, we can say, this marker is actually help us manage the patient in each one of these stations. So several things are we need to look when we test a, 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 a somebody with an essay or a marker. First of all, and I'm not going to stop on all the multiple studies, we need to look at epidemiology. And we need to see that from epidemiological standpoint, LPPLA2 is associated in more or less twofold increase in risk in multiple situations, multiple studies. From the WASCOP, the WHC, the Arterogen, multiple studies, LPPLA2 con continue to be an independent marker of event. So we know from epidemiology standpoint, LPPLA2 has a very good reputation uh, for predicting cardiovascular event in, in large epidemiological studies. Second, when we again test the marker, we need to be sure that it gives us information above and beyond the cholesterol level and also identify patients with a normal cholesterol. Because we know that about 70% of the patients come with, to us with coronary disease has a normal cholesterol. So we need to look for information that gives us, give us something beyond, even the patient has normal cholesterol, is this patient a high risk? 
So in this study, LPPLA2 gave us information of identifying risk in patients with LDA less than 130, similar to what CRP is giving us. And we use CRP as a reference marker because it's a ubiquitous marker and it's, uh, it's very commonly used. So one condition of a, mar of a good marker or factor is that it, it has good epidemiological data. It gives us information in patients with normal cholesterol. Another piece of evidence that you can differentiate between a good bioassay and a good marker, that it actually gives you information about stroke. Not many markers can predict stroke, which is, as you know, it's a devastating event. So most of the markers will give us information on a uh, heart attack or sudden death and things like that, but very few can predict stroke. And we need to pay attention to that because stroke is one of the major cause of death and uh, morbidity and mortality, and, in, and beyond the blood pressure. So LPPLA2 can predict stroke even with an patient in every, every level of blood pressure, and even with the blood pressure 130 to one, 130 to 130, elevated LPPLA2 can predict stroke. So LPPLA2 so far can predict the uh, uh, event in normal cholesterol, and in normal tensive can predict stroke. And third, we need to be sure that it's add information beyond commonly used markers. So it gives us information beyond CRP alone. So here we have that CRP is actually additive to CRP. It doesn't replace CRP, it doesn't substitute CRP, but give us information beyond the background of market that we are currently using. So generally, even if you don't look at LPPLA2, when you test a new market, you need to ask yourself this question, epidemiology, normal cholesterol, blood pressure and stroke, and beyond CRP. And all of that, uh, uh, LPPLA2 has uh, significant information to provide us. Now, the next step you ask yourself, does this marker take, play a role in the disease? Is it just a, a, like a temperature that tells us that there is an infection or actually participate in the disease? So what, what you do is you have to look, first of all, it's a marker in different disease stages. It has to participate in the disease. Correlate with the disease process, and I will go and tell you what I mean by that. And it's reversible. If it goes down, it's a good marker. If it goes up, it's a bad marker. So we start with the early stage of the disease. And if you have a good marker, you have to, it has to be elevated and it has to predict event in the very early stage of the disease, not only when the patient overhead of myocardial infarction or heart failure, but very, very early stage of the disease when the patient is asymptomatic. So the early stage of the disease is, in, uh, is risk factors and endothelial dysfunction. And we know that coronary arterial dysfunction or early stage of disease, you have uh, multiple risk factors, you have vascular injury, and we actually can look at endothelial dysfunction as a risk of the risk marker. The, the integration of risk factors leading to the disease and progression of disease and plaque progression and plaque, and plaque rupture. We know that endothelial dysfunction in asymptomatic patient is a strong predictor of event beyond any risk factor or any risk marker. And particularly, it's a, which I didn't bring on this slide, particularly even tenfold predict of event in women who do not usually have is ischemic event without any significant obstructive disease. So the first step that we use, we said, is that a marker for early disease and endothelial dysfunction? In order to do that, we look at patient that did not have symptoms, have symptoms mild of chest pain, do not have obstructive disease, do not have coronary disease, but they have evidence of endothelial dysfunction, or the, the vessel wall is dysfunction. And what we did, this is how we do that. You have a baseline, and you infuse acetylcholine, and you get vasoconstriction. And you can see from this data that LPPLA2 above 240 is a highly predictive of early stage of disease, the first stage of disease of endothelial dysfunction, better than cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and triglyceride. So they tell us that LPPLA2 maybe actually plays a role in the disease, and better predictor of early stage of disease than any of the conventional risk factors that we recognize and working. Now, the next step should be, does it actually play a role in the vessel itself? Does it actually play a role in the uh, progression of disease? Here again, just to remind you, 
that LPP2, the enzyme, split oxidized LDL to lysopecid oxidized fatty acid. So the way to do that is to see what happened to the LPP2 across the vessel. What happened to LPP2 across the coronary circulation? Is it produced from the plaque? Is it associated with inflammation of the vessel? And to do that, we can measure LPP2 at the aorta and the coronary sinus and do intravascular ultrasound and say, if you have a patient with very early plaque, without any obstructive disease, what happened to LPP2? Is it produced by the coronary circulation? And we can see, first of all, that you have, if you have early disease that you don't see on angiogram, but you use a more sophisticated imaging modality like a virtual histology, you can start seeing that this patient, even without obstructive disease, have a very vulnerable plaque here in the area here. And what we're able to show that there is a production of LPPLA2 across the coronary circulation in this patient without, without obstruction, early disease and endothelial dysfunction, the lesion itself, the early lesion is inflamed, the vessel is inflamed, and produce LPPLA2, and you can measure in the coronary sinus. It's not true for CRP, which is a more systemic marker, systemic marker of inflammation, and not specific to the vessel wall. So the another piece of information that you have about LPPLA2, beyond what we talked earlier, is the fact that it's more specific to the vessel at early stage of the disease. The release of LPPLA2 is actually correlated with the number with the plaque itself. So the more disease you have, the more LPPLA2 you have produced. Now, indirectly, if you have decrease in LPPLA2, you actually have decrease in lesion progression. So this is measure of LPPLA2 in 40 patients with acute coronary syndrome. They did an intravascular ultrasound and baseline in six months showing that if you have a decrease in LPPLA2 over time, the plaque is decreased. So here you have a, a marker that follow the disease process. More in early stage and progression inflammation decrease when the plaque uh, decrease. Another interesting point is what, what's the role of LPPLA2 in acute myocardial infarction? This is one area that we are very interested in. So the first thing that, one thing that we need to know is that the, the LPPLA2 is actually present in the plaque. It's not only the circulation, it's actually in the plaque itself. We got a hint of that when I show you that you, you have a production of LPPLA2 in the course of the coronary circulation. But what you have too here is the demonstration that the LPPLA2 is present in the plaque and mainly in the vulnerable plaque in the plaque rupture. You don't see it very much in the fibrotic plaque, but the, the more plaque becomes unstable, the more staining for LPPLA2 you have. This is from autopsy studies done by Renover Manis group. And actually, if you look at LPPLA2 levels in patients following myocardial infarction, LPPLA2 is a highly predictor of event following myocardial infarction. So it's not only present in the plaque, but it's a good marker for survival after myocardial infarction. And if you can see if you use any model with LPPLA2, their ROC is about 8, 0.852, which is very good curve for a prediction of event. So it's present in the plaque and it's prediction of event. And it also in another study done at Mayo, you can see that even a patient undergoing coronary angiography, it's a prediction of event. So we move in our disease process. Another important part, as I told you earlier, you need to show that this factor is actually playing a role in the disease. It's not only a circulating marker. It's actually participating in the disease. In order to do that, you can use carotid plaques that you take from the patient to demonstrate that LPPLA2 is present there and it participates in the disease. So we use carotid plaque to test the hypothesis that expression of LPPLA2 is higher in symptomatic patient rather than asymptomatic. So we, we took the plaque and we stained them, similar to what Vernover Mani did in the coronary, but we also, because we have a fresh tissue, was able to do expression, showing there is a high expression of LPPLA2 in the plaque in patients that have unstable uh, disease, like a TIA and a stroke, as compared to asymptomatic patient. Not only that, it's increasing. You have more in TIAs and stroke than in asymptomatic plaques. Now let's go back to the patient that I showed in the beginning, the two patients that I show you. This patient number A that I show you, 
And this is patient number B that I show you. And I, we asked the question at the beginning of the talk, who is the most vulnerable patient? On the surface, they look more or less the same. So patient number A, we look at the LPPLA2 expression in the plaque, and he has a very low expression of LPPLA2 in, in the carotid plaque when he came with his stroke. Patient number two have a high expression of LPPLA2 in the plaque. That's something that we don't know when we look at this patient. Now, patient number uh, two, that patient number one didn't have any event. Patient number two presented about two years later with inferior myocardial infarction. Now, if this is a coincidence, so this is just a case that I'm describing. Well, if we look at all the plaque that we took, about 200, the presence of expression of LPP2 in the carotid plaque actually predicts cardiac event which tell us that LPPLA2 is a more marker for vascular inflammation and progression of plaque in any vascular bed. So the more plaque you have in the carotid, the more coronary event you had, including revascularization. And this is the curve showing the event rate in patients that have high expression of LPPLA2 in the carotid plaque. So the presence of LPPLA2 in the tissue itself was able to predict cardiovascular event. Now, how about reversibility? You want to have something that on, not only participate in the disease, but actually you can target as a therapy and tell you is this, is this uh, can reverse the disease. So we have uh, inhibition of LP, this is a study that was done in the pigs, and we have currently an LPP2 inhibitor, which is a droplidib, which is in clinical trials. And this is a study done in the pig, showing that if you inhibit the activity of LPPLA2, the one that we measure and predict event, you actually have decrease in the plaque. This is the control group, and this is the treated group. It's also able to reduce the number of the macrophages there, and the necrotic core, which is the, probably the baseline of plaque rupture. And this study also was done in carotid plaque, showing that, again, in the plaque itself, if you inhibit the enzyme in the plaque, you're actually able to inhibit all parameters of inflammation in the plaque itself. This was translated to a clinical study where actually they took patients, they imaged them with virtual histology, randomized them to inhibition of the LPPLA2, and followed them, able to show that the group that the LPPLA2 enzyme was inhibited, then there is a lack of progression of the necrotic core, as you can see here. That means that not only it's a marker, not only it participated in the disease, but it had actually been targeted as a therapy. All this information led to, as you know, to we are working, trying to work by guidelines and recommendations. So this has led to uh, uh, risk management. And let's give you another, just a sample of a case of a 69-year-old woman with a, uh, a little bit overweight, high blood pressure, no family history, non-smoker, and she has a visit one, and this was her parameters, cholesterol, HDL, uh, higher, elevated, and then she was treated, and based on the basic panel result, the result in the normal range. So when you go back to the, after she second visit, you can see that the cholesterol normalized, the, uh, uh, the blood pressure more better. However, her, her markers of LPPLA2 were not normalized, which is probably uh, show that she's still having a vascular inflammation going on, and we need to modify the treatment in order to increase her event. So this is a patient you probably see all the time in your clinic. So the patient can reclassify from moderate to high, to high risk with an LDL goal of less than 100, uh, uh, but because of her high PPLA2 and LDL should be less than 70, not 100. So I think LPPLA2 can help us tremendously in reclassifying the patient. So I think we have a major issue with the patient with the moderate. And I think the moderate should be reclassified to low moderate and high moderate based on what we know. And I think if you look at LPPLA2 testing, I think it can help you differentiate between the moderate low and the moderate high to let you better uh, follow the patient. So I was trying to convince you that if you have a epidemiological study, it are not enough. What you need to ask yourself 
is this marker that show promise in epidemiological study actually plays a role in the disease and how can you differentiate between all the multiple markers that are currently available to us as a physician to tell us which are the right one. And so we are able to show that there is a translation of basic mechanism to cardiovascular event. And that led to uh, uh, several uh, recommendations of LPPLA2. This is from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology Guidelines. Again, placing inflammation markers such as CRP and LPPLA2 uh, as a non-traditional risk uh, factors that can help us to take care of the patient. And here, this is from the European Guidelines for Cardiovascular Disease Prevention and Clinical Practice, just came out in 2012. Again, showing the lipoprotein uh, uh, has recently emerged as a marker for high consistency and precision as an intermediate risk factors for plaque rupture and natural thrombotic event. So I think all this data showing us that we need to not only look at the Framingham score, but actually for patients now that probably have a different disease than patients have 60 years ago, uh, have to use new markers that actually participate in the disease and help us identify the patient at risk. So I hope that I will able to at least give you some information that from all the forests of the markers that we have, LPPLA2 has promising role in identifying the patient at risk. Thank you.